in December of last year, Nicaragua actually broke ties, diplomatic ties with Taiwan and re formerly recognized the People's Republic of China. Around the same time, also Nicaragua joined China's Belt and Road Initiative. I want to get your take on the mood in Nicaragua, because oftentimes when the West, Western media, corporate media talk about China and Latin America, they talk about it in this manner where China is the colonial power and the imperialist power, and that it only seeks to dominate the region and essentially take the U.S.'s front yard from it, right? Because that's what Joe Biden called Latin America. So, yeah, what's the mood like uh, about growing relations with China and Nicaragua? And, yeah, your take on this growing phenomenon of, of closer Latin America-China ties overall. Well, yeah, Danny, you mentioned that the difference between Joe Biden and Donald Trump is that the Donald Trump administration called Latin America the U.S. backyard and Joe Biden calls Latin America the U.S. front yard. But really, we've seen a continuation in terms of Latin America of basically all of Trump's policies. And, you know, it's funny is now we see that over Ukraine and the fact that the U.S. said it's no longer going to import Russian oil, we've seen that the Biden administration had this emergency meeting with the president of Venezuela, the real president, the elected president, Nicolas Maduro. And that was the first time I've seen mainstream corporate media outlets in the U.S. acknowledge since early 2019, since January 2019, that Maduro is the real president of the country. So, I mean, while Biden is having these emergency meetings, he still is technically recognizing Juan Guaido as fake imaginary president of Venezuela. And in terms of Nicaragua, we've seen an escalation of the devastating policies that the Trump administration started against Nicaragua. Now, of course, the Trump administration didn't start those policies historically. People probably know of the U.S.-backed terrorist war in the 1980s here in Nicaragua, in which the CIA funded and trained the Contra death squads. And, and where does the word Contra come from? Contra is contra revolución, contra revolucionario. That's to, that's to say, counter revolution. That's literally what they called themselves, the counter revolutionaries. So, of course, the U.S. has a long history, going back further, of militarily invading and occupying Nicaragua. Going back to the man himself, Sandino, Augusto Sandino, the name of the Sandinista movement comes from this revolutionary fighter who created a guerrilla army in the 1920s and 30s and fought to successfully expel the U.S. military occupiers from Nicaragua. The U.S. has a history of militarily invading and occupying Nicaragua three times historically, and then, of course, backing, propping up the brutal right-wing dictatorship of the Somoza dynasty for decades. So, I mean, the, the idea that China is supposedly a colonial power in Latin America it's laughable. It's preposterous. And in Latin America, the only people who believe that are like 0.1% of the population who are the English speaking elites who have dual passports, who spend a lot of their time in the United States and Western Europe, who are almost universally right wing, neoliberal, economically speaking. And they are part of the imperialist structure. But the vast majority of people in Latin America they, they recognize that as ridiculous propaganda, and they can clearly see that it's the United States that is the colonial and neo-colonial power in Latin America. It's the United States that not only has this history, going back to the Monroe Doctrine in the 1820s, of declaring Latin America to be its so-called backyard, but still today, the United States continues to back violent coup attempts to impose, impose brutal sanctions. So in 2018, here in Nicaragua, the, U the U.S. backed a brutally violent coup attempt in which hundreds of people were killed, in which Sandinista activists were hunted down. They were tortured on camera. Some of them were killed. Their bodies were lit on fire by these fascists backed by the United States. And the U.S. acted as though it was a supposedly a brutal authoritarian regime cracking down on peaceful protesters using the same kind of narrative this propaganda narrative that was used to sell the regime change war on Syria, as if it was this brutal one-sided war by the so-called regime in scare quotes against peaceful protesters. No, I mean, it was a brutally violent coup attempt and it failed in 2018. And ironically, the failure of that US-backed coup attempt has actually strengthened 
the Sandinista Front. It actually has helped radicalize the Sandinista movement here in Nicaragua, and it precipitated a move toward a more nationalistic and anti-imperialist foreign policy. Because, I mean, we can talk, I don't want to spend the entire stream talking about it because it would be a long story, but in short, when the Sandinistas came back to power in 2007 through democratic elections, they, they decided to take an incrementalist approach, a gradual approach to implementing their program because they knew that if they were too quick in the policies they implemented, that it would invite yet another terrorist war by the U.S. and sanctions and all of these policies that we've seen the U.S. carry out in the past several years. And since the failure of that U.S. coup attempt, it, it encouraged the Sandinistas to, to move forward more quickly with the revolutionary program, whereas before they had been moving more gradually. And that led to them increasing their relationship with Russia, which is one of Nicaragua's closest allies. And Nicaragua has supported Russia throughout NATO's encirclement and mm -hmm. the U.S. created war in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. and, and then that leads us to what you mentioned, which is Nicaragua breaking ties with Taiwan. And I mean, that's a whole long story that we could talk about maybe another time. But the reality is that the Sandinistas had recognized the People's Republic of China in the 1980s. It was the neoliberal era in 1990 when the U.S. puppet, the right-wing oligarch, Violeta Chamorro, when she came to power through a CIA-funded campaign that was in an election manipulated by the U.S., she immediately cut ties with the PRC and recognized mm -hmm. Taiwan. So that was a decision of the U.S.-backed right-wing forces. But the Sandinistas did decide to finally break ties. And since then, I mean, it's only been a few months, but Nicaragua has become a very close ally of China. China is in the local Nicaraguan media pretty much every day talking about different projects that China is helping to build, including a public housing program, infrastructure projects, water sanitation projects. There's many things that they're doing. And of course, I mentioned that Nicaragua is also a very close ally of Russia. So in short, the last thing I'll say before pivoting back to you, Danny, is that I think what we're seeing is the further implementation of a project of integration that goes back to Hugo Chavez. Carlos mentioned that when Hugo Chavez came in in the early 2000s in Venezuela, he began talking about this concept of pluriplurality. And what he really recognized is that the future of Latin America not only lies in the project of regional integration of Latin America, which is important, of course, the idea they call the Patria Grande, the, the great motherland combining all of the Americas, but Chavez also had the prescience of recognizing that, you know, there are a lot of right-wing neo-colonial regimes in Latin America that are basically puppets of the United States. And he recognized that if you wanted to build socialism in the 21st century, you had to build this idea of pluripolarity or multipolarity. And he started looking across the ocean, not to the north of the United States and Canada, but rather to China and to Russia and Iran. So this comes back to the original topic we were talking about, which is the integration of China and Eurasia in general with Latin America. And I, it's, this is part of the vision of these leftist movements in Latin America, these revolutionary movements that recognize that they're, they have much more in common with these Eurasian powers that had revolutionary movements like in China and Iran than they do with the colonial powers in North America. Right. I mean, it, and it also gets down to like what, I mean, what does China offer and what does Latin America have to offer? Because I think oftentimes when we talk about and when, when, when people talk, especially on the left here and in at least our parts of the world, Carlos and I's parts of the world, uh, they often talk separately, right? Latin America, the left, that's happening. Uh, there, there generally is a bit more sympathy towards, you know, the, the quote unquote pink tide or the leftist movements. And then China is generally cast as outside of the leftist sphere, unfortunately. I think that's why we're all here <laughs> today, you know, to kind of uh, dispel that. But Carlos, uh, what, I, you know, I mean, Ben, you can jump in on this too. What are the benefits of this growing partnership? Ben, you mentioned a bit about Nicaragua and the public housing and the growing relations, the trade relations, and how that is benefiting Nicaragua. 
but I think there's there's definitely a regional benefit for Latin America to grow closer with China and for China also to grow closer to Latin America. Uh, it, you know, I, I think about the COVID-19 pandemic in the beginning, the, the biotech industry between China and Cuba, that relationship saved countless lives in China. The, the availability of antivirals that aren't available in the United States, aren't mm-hmm. available in the Western world uh, by any stretch of the imagination. So I just think of that and, and see just how beneficial on both sides this is. So Carlos, you first, you know, if you want to comment on, on yeah, that sure. and then you can jump in. Um, yeah, and no, I just just to kind of follow up uh, before going into that on something that Ben said about um, how 0.1% of the population in Nicaragua might believe that China is the new imperialist force in, in, in Latin America. And I'm just thinking, you know, Danny in New York City, myself in London, probably it's more like 0.1% of the population don't think that China is the new colonialist force in Latin America. And ultimately, that, yeah, that comes down to, obviously, we're exposed to incredible nonstop propaganda, which relates to, like so many other things, racism and imperialism. On the one hand, a racism that says, well, you've got these Chinese and they're kind of cynical and kind of inscrutable um, and they're just you know, out for their own interests and no one knows what, really what they're thinking, but they're fundamentally kind of these evil... Uh, Fu Manchu type characters that want the, that seek world domination, and then on the other hand, you've got the Latin Americans, and they're, for want of a more elegant expression, a bit stupid, you know, a bit overly trusting, a bit naive, and hence they they sign these de- these deals with the Chinese without realizing what they're getting into, as if Latin America, having gone through five hundred years of colonialism doesn't recognize colonialism when it sees it, you know, and then it's the same dynamic with Africa, that Africa has been plundered and actively developed by the imperialist powers. Now China comes with Belt and Road deals and and the Africans can't can't recognize colonialism, can't recognize imperialism, hegemonism and domination. And then it's like, Look at, you know, as Ben pointed out, look at look at the actual difference in, in China's record in Latin America if you compare it to the European colonial powers and then in the in the 19th and 20th century to the United States. What coups has China organized in Latin America? What regime change has China organized in Latin America? What troops, what military bases does China have in Latin America? What unilateral illegal sanctions and in embargoes does China impose in Latin America and the Caribbean? So uh, the, the whole, you know, imperialism is, isn't just a word and it's not just a policy choice. Imperialism is a system. It's a political and economic and military system, which the United States and the big West European powers can be, can be shown to be engaged in and that China can be shown not to be engaged in. Um, but, you know, really just really happy to hear that people in pl- countries like Nicaragua don't consume propaganda in the same way uh, that we're forced to in in Britain and the United States. Now, in terms of the benefits that countries can get from from these deals, from the Belt and Road, from these trade deals and these investment deals uh, in Latin America, there's a lot that can be said about this. But if if we talk specifically about the Belt and Road, it's really about recognizing a gap in terms of infrastructure, particularly railways, roads, ports, energy networks, clean energy production in particular is, is, a, is a massive thing. And, and Cuba, for example, has just signed up to the Belt and Road Energy Partnership. And the idea, the idea there is that you know, Cuba doesn't have its own kind of domestic energy resources or very limited domestic energy resources. Um, so it's got to meet its population's needs in terms of energy. Um, and you know, if you go to Cuba today, the, the blackouts are relatively common. Like there's there's there, there's genuine energy problems there. At the same time, Cuba is a very responsible country in terms of climate change and and the environment and biodiversity. And Fidel Castro has been kind of a a lonely voice on the world stage at the UN General Assembly since the 80s, talking about climate change when. You know, nearly everyone in, in the Western ruling classes thought it was basically some kind of left-wing hoax. You know, no one was talking about climate change when Fidel was talking about it. Um, so Cuba's always been kind of a, a thought leader in that field. And in terms of agricultural sustainability and all the rest of it, they've been really good. But currently, only about 6% of their power comes from renewable sources. Meanwhile, 
over the last 10, 20 years, China has really emerged as the kind of unparalleled global leader in renewable energy, in wind and in solar. Um, so there's a big opportunity now for, for Cuba to meet its target of getting to 30% renewable by 2030, through specifically through its cooperation with China on this Belt and Road Initiative. So, you know, that's that's just one example. There's tons of cooperation in the area of housing. There's tons of cooperation in the area of health. Out of every two COVID vaccines that have been administered in Latin America and the Caribbean over the past two years, one has been manufactured in China. So, um, and, and, you know, I went to hear uh, Luis Arce, the president of Bolivia, speak recently uh, in, in London. To, to the Bolivian community. And I managed to get an invite on the basis of speaking Spanish and being pro-Bolivia. And it, he said, you know, Bolivia is a country, the, ma the majority of our economy is informal. You know, in terms of dealing with COVID, there's no way that we can just tell everyone, well, work from home guys, it's fine, you'll, you'll be fine. Just work from home for a few months and then we'll come back, you know. You can't sell hot dogs on the street from home. So the ability to vaccinate the population and get to some kind of return to economic normality is an existential thing for a country like that. And he said, we were promised vaccines from everywhere. COVAX promised us, the US promised us, but they didn't deliver. In the end, it was Russia and China that came knocking on our door and said, we know you need vaccines. We would like to provide you with vaccines. We'd like to donate you vaccines. We would like to sell you some vaccines. And we would like to set up a production deal so that we can produce vaccines with you under, you know, joint enterprises in Bolivia um, so that all your people can get vaccinated and that you can you know, start to really get on top of the pandemic. So, you know, there's the cooperation runs across the board. You know, it's not just it's not just roads. It's not just ports. It's also healthcare. It's also um, renewable energy. It's also like advanced, like AI driven healthcare and new technology. And another thing with Bolivia is that China built the or China cooperated with Bolivia to build the satellite, uh, the Tupac Qatari satellite, which provides um, internet and phone services throughout the country, you know, to every district of Bolivia. And that was built by the Chinese under a joint production agreement and is owned by the Bolivians. Um, so, you know, there's, there's really a lot that you can say, but it, that's so important that relatively underdeveloped countries in Latin America and the Caribbean can finally get access to the latest technology without having to sign up to IMF deals, without having to submit to, um, you know, deregulation, liberalization of foreign trade, 